All right. For those of you that are not with us normally on a Wednesday night, we have been doing a study of uh, the life of Jacob. Genesis 32, really, is where we've been spending our time. And this is the third of three messages on Jacob's life. But the theme of it is our selfishness, the self-life. And Jacob is a great illustration of that. At the climax of the long story of Jacob's life in the Bible, and in Genesis 32, God's not only trying to bless Jacob, he's actually attempting to completely change, transform Jacob's life. I think Jacob's name is illustrative. You know what his name means? Literally, the name Jake, by the way, my name is James, and James is a derivative of Jacob. And it's not a very flattering name. The name uh, Jacob means one who takes by the heel or the heel grabber. Uh, one who grabs, one who grasps. And that is a picture of this man's character. He is very graspy. And you know what? Graspiness, if I can call it that, is really essentially the biblical picture of sin. Can I define sin for you in a way, perhaps, young ladies and young gentlemen that you've never thought of before? It's this. Here's what sin is. You've heard it said, well, sin is breaking God's law. Well, that's true. But there's something even more basic than that about sin. And I want to tell you what it is. It's illustrated in Jacob's life. And it's simply this. To push to achieve your own way rather than submit to God's way. That is the essence of sin. Have you ever heard it defined like that? Sin, biblically, is simply determining to have it your way instead of letting God have his way in your life. That's exactly what Jacob pictures for us here in Genesis chapter 32. If you were with us before, you know that God and Jacob had a wrestling match. You know, the Jewish people don't think that, uh, that God could ever come in human form. He did all the time in the Old Testament. This is just one example of it. In Genesis 32, God comes in human form and literally physically wrestles. Have you ever seen a wrestling match? I mean, a college or a high school wrestling match. I don't mean the fake stuff, the, you know, the, what, the worldwide uh, wrestling federation. I don't mean that stuff. But I mean a real wrestling match. Have you ever seen one on TV? God wrestled a man. Isn't that incredible? And it's all recorded here for us in Genesis uh, 32. And for those of you that weren't with us before, I'm going to have you turn here and I want to read this to you. In verse 24 of Genesis 32, look at it in your Bible. It says, Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him. That man is God. God in a human form as a man. There wrestled a man with him until dawn, until the breaking of the day. Verse 25, and when he, that is God, who came in human form, saw that he prevailed not against him, against Jacob, God, as a man, touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Look at verse 26. Here's kind of where we pick it up. It's where we left off. And he said, that is God in human form speaking, says to Jacob, let me go for the day breaketh. And Jacob, look at what he says, verse 26. 
I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. What we have is a man contesting with God. It's a contest. It's a contest between a man and God. Someone asked me, I guess after one of the messages on this recently, how could, uh, because I said that Jacob was not wanting God's blessing, he was fighting God's blessing, and someone asked me, how could Jacob be said to be fighting God's blessing when it's recorded in that 26th verse that he asked God to bless him? Here's the answer. One word, resistance. Jacob was in a mode of resisting God. You see, all of Jacob's life, he had been trying to wrestle God's blessing from him. He'd been trying to wrestle God's blessing upon his life his own way. Trying to get it by scheming, by manipulating, by cheating, just like his name. Jacob's wrestling with God in human form here in this chapter is really a striking example of you and of me. It's a striking example of how obstinate our self-will is that resists God's will. God withstood Jacob, and Jacob resisted God. He's contesting with God. It is resistance to God on Jacob's part. That's human nature. That's what you and I do. We do it all the time. Don't even think about it. Don't have to. It comes natural. It's just what we do. Resistance to God. But I want you to think about the other person, God in human form. While Jacob is involved in resistance against God, God is involved in persistence regarding Jacob. It's incredible enough that God loved Jacob and that through Jacob, God would actually raise up a nation. We know that nation now to be the Jewish people. God would raise up a nation out of which the Savior of the world would come from the likes of this guy, Jacob. It's unbelievable that God would use such a deceitful person to continue his redemption plan in this earth. You know what that tells me? There's not a single person, young person, older people, whoever we are here tonight, God has persistently worked with you. God's not done with you. God hasn't given up on you. If you are a believer, you know what the Bible promises? That he which hath begun a good work in us will perform it until the day of Christ. That is, until Jesus comes back. God's persistence, despite yours and my resistance, contesting. There's a second thing going on here. Besides contesting, look at what happens when God injures Jacob. He touches the hall of his thigh. His thigh is put out of, can you imagine? Have you ever had a finger out of joint? That's painful. Ever had a, a arm out of joint? That's really painful. Can you imagine having a hip out of joint? Maybe you have had that happen. What happens? Look with me in uh, this uh 26th verse again, where Jacob says, I will not let you go except you bless me. Here the whole story changes from Jacob contesting with God 
Now Jacob is clinging on to God. This is the crisis that brought about the real change, the transformation. But notice this, young people. Jacob didn't change until a crisis came into his life, until God touched his thigh and put it out of joint. Up to that moment, Jacob was on the defensive. But now he can no longer defend himself. Now he is in a state of incompetence. You know what it means to be incompetent? To be incompetent means that you don't have any ability. You're totally unable to cope. He's in a place of incompetence. Now all of Jacob's ability to defend himself is totally gone. Instantly, his power to resist has vanished when God touches the hollow of his thigh, puts his thigh out of joint. Jacob could no longer wrestle. Wrestling Jacob became hanging on or clinging Jacob. Grasping Jacob became clinging Jacob. He passed from wrestling and resisting to a stage of clinging for dear life. <laughs> and when he said what he did in that 26th verse to God, I will not let you go except you bless me. I want you to understand, this wasn't the first time Jacob ever met God. Jacob was not ignorant of God. He had a, a saving revelation of God at a place called Bethel 20 years prior to this incident. But you know what? Jacob was still a very carnal, carnal believer. And you know what I've discovered? That's really par for the course in the Christian life. The majority of Christians are very carnal Christians. The kind that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he said, I wanted to feed you with real meat of the word, but you were such babies, I couldn't give you any solid food. I had to feed you milk. I had to nurse you like a mother. He said, you're carnal. You're, you're just into yourself. It's all about you. That's what carnality is. And so Jacob Yes, he had a meeting with God 20 years prior to this, but he's still a very carnal, very carnal believer. And it, it takes time for you and I to realize just how deeply self-centered we are. Have you thought about that about yourself? Have you ever thought of yourself as, as being self-centered or do you just blame other people for being self-centered? Young people, have you ever thought about how self-centered you are? We are so full of ourselves. The self-centeredness of sin permeates our whole life. And the only way that will ever change is that the Holy Spirit brings you as an individual and me as an individual to the end of ourselves that he takes us down a couple of notches until we see and we admit just how self-centered we really are. Jacob came to the point of incompetence. He couldn't pull it off anymore. And he was only, the only thing he could do. When you come to the end of your competence, when you become incompetent, the only thing you can do is either you, you crack up or you crash and burn, or you learn to depend upon the Lord. You turn your incompetence into dependence. And that's what happens here. This occasion in Genesis 32 marks the second crisis in Jacob's spiritual life. As important as the first was, when God revealed himself there at Bethel as the God of his father and his, uh, uh, his grandfather, as important as that was, this is just as important, this meeting here. And by the way, 
You ever hear of the book of Hosea? It's just a, a small book way in the back of the Old Testament. It's called a minor prophet because it's not big. It's a small book. The book of Hosea, chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, gives us additional information about this wrestling incident that's not in Genesis 32. And here's what it says. It says, when Jacob's thigh was put out of joint, he wept or he cried and he made supplication unto God. That is, he prayed. So he cried to God in prayer. Jacob was crying as he was clinging for dear life. And he was praying. What do you think he was praying for? What do you think he was asking God? Well, if he said, I won't let you go except you bless me, guess what he was praying for? He was praying for the blessing of God in his life because now he realized he could not wrestle that blessing out of God's hands by his own competence. Now he had to depend upon God to bless him. Now he's completely dependent upon God for it. He's not seeking to get it any longer by his scheming, by his deceitfulness, by his manipulating. He's unwilling to allow this opportunity for God to bless him, to pass him by. Have you ever arrived at that place in your life where you had an opportunity for God to bring great blessing into your life? If you ever get there or if you... Don't ever let that opportunity pass you by because the blessing of God on your life, young people, is the most important thing in all the world. You know why? Because you just didn't happen to come into this world because your father and mother brought you into this world. Young people, God brought you into this world and God brought you into this world because he has a purpose for your life and his great purpose for your life is God loves you or he would not have ever had you been born. And he wants a personal relationship with you. And you'll never be happy until you get out of yourself and you start focusing on God and the relationship that he wants to have with you. This is what Jacob discovered. And it ended with a third thing. He started contesting and then he was clinging and finally, God saw to it that he was changing. At the moment, Jacob had his thigh out of joint. He was broken before the Lord. All he could do was to cling and to cry. And that was when the transforming change happened in his life. Look at with me again in the Bible. Verse 27. This is God's answer to Jacob when he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. What does God answer? How does God respond to that? Look at verse 27. And he, that's God in human form, says to Jacob, what's your name? Don't think God knew his name. Don't think God knew who Jacob was. You see what he's doing? God, when God asks him, what is your name? He's saying, I want to hear from you who you really are. I want you to acknowledge who you really are. What's your name? Remember what I told you the name Jacob means? When God said, what's your name? He would have to say, my name is, I'm the grasper. I'm the manipulator. I'm the schemer. I'm the cheater. I'm the deceiver. God is asking, what's your name? Because your deliverance from your self-centeredness, and don't sit here and think, I'm not self-centered. If you think that, you're the epitome of self-centeredness. And the only way, and, and, and all of us need deliverance from our self-centeredness, or our lives are going to just, they're just going to spiral out of control. You know why people are depressed? You know why people get angry? 
You know why people uh, just lose it? Because we're self-centered. That's what it's all about. And so God is asking, who are you? You have to come face to face with who you really are. Because you'll never be delivered from your self-centeredness until you come to see and also acknowledge who you really are. And you'll never acknowledge it until God breaks you. Have you ever been broken by God? Have you ever been brought to the end of your self-centeredness by God? When God breaks you, you'll know what you are and you'll acknowledge it before him. Broken Jacob acknowledged his self-centeredness and that then led to his deliverance. By the way, if you're a believer, that's really who you were. You're not that person you used to be, you know. You're a new person in Christ. And the new person that you are in Christ, we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, is that you no longer live for yourself, but you live for him. The whole center of your life has shifted and self has moved off and Christ has come dead center. And if you're a believer, you know who you are? You're a Christ-centered person. That's who you are. Well, look at the Lord as he deals with Jacob. Look one more time with me in verse 28. He made him admit that his name was Jacob, that he was a self-centered person. And then here's what God said to him. Your name will no longer be called grasper or schemer or deceiver or cheater, Jacob, but your name will be called Israel. For as a prince, you have power with God and with men, and you have prevailed. Now he has a new name because now he's a new person. His scheming, manipulation has uh, passed, and now God says, you're a prince with me. And he calls him Israel. You know what Israel means, literally? Let God rule. Let God rule your life. That's what Israel means. Let God rule. The sovereign God who cares enough to single out a self-seeking, a selfish person, turns you into a world changer. That's who Jacob became. Your only hope is that you allow God to rule in your life. Young people, you are bound for terrible failure until you allow God to rule in your life. Otherwise, you're going to fail. You're going to fail in a marriage. You're going to fail in anything you really undertake until you learn to let God rule in your life and let God overrule your selfishness, your self-centeredness, and then you'll be a blessing. Then you'll be blessed, and you'll be a blessing to other people as well. So the fact of the matter is, folks, in God alone, there's hope for the transformation of a grasping human heart. Are you among those that, that have experienced this kind of deliverance? That's who you are in Christ. Did you know that if you're a believer, you died to your old self and you rose in Christ to be a new person, a new self? Did you know that if you're a believer, your human spirit that was totally dead to Christ has now been, uh, has been awakened and has been given resurrection life because your human spirit is joined to the spirit of Christ himself? 
there's a lot of ways that our selfishness gets expressed. But one common way that the self-life manifests itself is by seeking to protect our reputation. One of my heroes, he's with the Lord, is Dr. Dennis Kinlaw. Everything that that man ever wrote, I have, and I either have read or I'm reading. He was the former president of Asbury University. And he said that during the middle of his academic career, his son was in his late teen years, and his son was trying to find his own way in distinction from his dad. And during that period of time when his teenage son was disrespectful and chose to show his, his rebellion, he did so in ways that seemed to deliberately, he deliberately attempted to embarrass his dad publicly. So, Dr. Kinlaw, he was urged as a result to pray for God to change his son. He prayed like that for a while. And then the Holy Spirit asked him, why are you praying so urgently for me to change your son? And suddenly, Kinlaw said he realized that he was more concerned about his own reputation than he was about the Lord and his own son. And he saw that his praying was filtered through a grid of selfishness and self-centeredness. And he thought how Jesus wasn't overly concerned about his reputation when he suffered on that cross shame for me. And he knew immediately that his own fear of embarrassment came from a desire to protect his own ego. And his concern for his son was really corrupted by what people would think of him. And so the Holy Spirit led him to realize this was hindering his prayer for his son's return. So eventually, he found himself praying this, and I quote, Lord, my reputation doesn't matter. You and your will for my son is what matters. Forgive me and cleanse my selfish heart. And Ken Law said, you know, I never regretted that prayer. Eventually, his son got right with the Lord and came back into fellowship with his dad as well. Isn't it amazing that even our praying can be selfish? It, we can even we can even want the right thing, but for the wrong reasons, for selfish reasons. That's why we must have a personal encounter, a personal touch from God to experience God's blessing in our life. Same man that I just gave this illustration, he said, when a person loses control of themselves and rests totally in God's hands, they find themselves. Got that? When a person loses control of themselves and rests totally in God, they find themselves. You know what? We got some finding to do. When in my generation, the hippie generation, that was the that was the watchword. We're, we got to find ourselves. We're going to find ourselves. But we were finding ourselves. We never found ourselves because we were looking in all the wrong places. We we're trying to find ourselves in drugs and sex and rock and roll. The only place you'll find yourself is when you look to God. And that will cure that self-centeredness in you and me. And you'll be blessed and be a blessing.